Mark, it's great to have you. Thanks so much for joining us today. Um, I want to kick things off by asking you a fun question, I think. Where did the idea for hypnosis come from? Um, so, you know, hypnosis is a uh, public listed company in the UK. It's, a, you know, it's gone in the two years plus that it's existed from being um, on the specialist fund segment of the uh, London stock market to last year being a premier listed company to this year being a FTSE 250 company. So it's one of the 350 biggest companies on the stock market. It's currently the number 23 biggest yielder, meaning there are only 22 companies that are paying a bigger dividend um, than we are. And we have, you know, in two years, uh, we've, you know, now at a, a, a 1.1 billion pound market cap. But at its core, what it's about is great proven songs, these big hit songs that are the fabric of our society. Everything from We Are Family to Sweet Dreams Are Made of This to Living on a Prayer to Let's Stay Together to Single Ladies Put a Ring on It, Umbrella, Shape of You, etc. And these great proven songs have very predictable, reliable income. And in most cases, they have data that goes back for decades that demonstrates this great, predictable, reliable income. And the investment community, you know, looks at, uh, uh, you know, things like golden oil for similar reasons, because again, they have predictable and reliable income. But in fact, songs are better because they're uncorrelated. The revenues from songs are uncorrelated to what's happening in the world. So, you know, if Donald Trump wakes up tomorrow and does something, the chances are that the price of gold and the price of oil are affected. But if you're living your best life, you're doing it to a soundtrack of music equally well. If you're experiencing the sort of challenges that we've experienced over the last six months with the pandemic, you're taking comfort and you're escaping with music and a three or four minute long song is about the only thing in the world the only art form in the world that can take you from wanting to jump off a building and end it all to suddenly feeling four minutes later like you're invincible and you can take on the world so the revenues are are as i say uncorrelated there's a big desire in the marketplace for uncorrelated revenues and when you look at our performance in the last six months, you know, at a point in time, you know, that, that, you know, most companies have either stopped paying dividends or have had to cut their dividends. As I say, we've been, you know, the number 23 biggest, div, you know, dividend yielder on the, on the London stock market. And our dividend is growing, not decreasing. And it's a testament to having established these great proven songs as an asset class. Music uh, now more than ever has taken on a whole new reality for the world. And in fact, is that sort of part of the company thesis in many ways? Or can you expand a little bit more on, on what the thesis is behind hypnosis? Well, the thesis is is, is very simple. It's 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 multi-part, but 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 it's it's quite simple. Um, on the one hand, we had technological disruption in the music industry between 2001 and 2016 that uh you know decimated the business because people were able to listen to music ostensibly for free via illegal downloading and that almost killed the music industry off and the only good thing that came out of that was that it's left these great songs available at attractive prices at a point in time when streaming has then come along you know, that, that technology that was illegal downloading has evolved into streaming and streaming has once again made it more convenient for people to consume music legally and to pay for it. And in the last uh, two plus years since we've been going, we've gone from 50 million paid subscribers worldwide to streaming services to 400 million paid subscribers today to what will be 460 million by the end of this year and what are predicted to be as many as 2 billion paid subscribers by the end of the decade. So on the one hand, we're buying the songs at attractive prices. On the other hand, the pie is exploding and growing dramatically. We also predicted when we came to the market 
that the copyright board, which is the judicial board in the United States, that rules on how a songwriter is paid would look favorably on the songwriter because the songwriter had only had three raises in the past past eight, six years, believe it or not. Um, and we were right, the copyright board last year passed into law that uh, the songwriter would incrementally receive between last year and the end of 2022, a 44% greater share of the pie. So a dollar's worth of income that we bought last year will be worth a dollar 44 by the end of 2022 without us having to do anything where we really then step in and add value is that we have a concept that's called song management versus the traditional publishing model. In the traditional publishing model, these big song companies have as many as 20,000 songs per person. We have 500 to 1,000 songs per person. So we have much more bandwidth to be able to put the songs in movies, TV commercials, video games, have new artists interpolate those, those songs, have new songwriters, uh, uh, sorry, new songwriters interpolate those songs, have artists cover those songs, et cetera, and really add significant value. So in the past year alone, we've issued more than a thousand licenses and they've been everything from, you know, $2 million for uses of journeys don't stop believing to, you know, as little as, you know, tens of, of literally thousands of songs that are going in shows like American Idol and The Voice for, you know, $1,000 at a, at, a, at, a, at a time. And then in addition to that, we bring efficiencies to the collections of the songs. So when uh, we buy the songs, we buy the net of the administration fee. The administration fee can be anything from 15% to 40%. We move them to a company called Cobalt, which is a technology company. Our rate there is single digits. So we immediately have as much as a you know 10% to 35% uplift in uh, uh, the, the administration fee that we're paying um, for the money to be collected around the world. And in addition to that, with tech, Cobalt being a technology company, they have a reputation for collecting more money, collecting it faster, paying it through faster, and they do it completely transparently. So our monies are arriving in real time, or at least the notification on the monies are arriving in real time. We're being paid on a monthly basis, and it's a far more efficient way of collecting monies, and it allows us to add really significant value for our shareholders. And then the final part of the thesis is that my company and myself, we're, we're the only people that are doing this where, on the one hand, you know, where we have a real strategy, um, it's not just a financial instrument for us. To the finance community, we are an investment advisor. To the music community, we are a proper music company. And, and you know, considering that all of our assets come directly from songwriters and artists and producers, these are highly emotional transactions for these great creators because on the one hand, money is an important component. On the other hand, they want to know that these metaphorical children that they've given birth to, these great songs, are going to go into the hands of somebody that cares about them. And they, you know, I'm the only person that's doing this who's made his money and his reputation with artists and songwriters and producers, as opposed to at the expense of artists and songwriters and producers. And they know that I understand the ethos on which they've built their careers, that I'll make decisions that are commensurate with the decisions that they would make, that I'll consult and work with them on a daily basis. Um, and then in addition to that, you know, we have our motive, which we explain to the artists and songwriters and producers, which is that we want to make money for our shareholders and for ourselves. I'm very clear about the fact that we believe that these assets will triple in value over the next decade. But equally well, we have an ulterior motive, and the ulterior motive is to change where the songwriter sits in the economic equation through the financial wherewithal that we have at being a billion pound plus market cap company, and through the leverage that these extraordinary songs that we own bring us. And you know, the songwriter is the low man or woman on the totem pole in the economic equation because the three big 
the song companies in the world can't advocate for them because they're owned by the three biggest recorded music companies in the world. And on the recorded music side of the business, they're getting four fifths of the money. They're getting an 80% gross margin, a 40% net margin. And in general, they own those assets in perpetuity. On the song side of the business, you've got a fifth of the revenue, a fifth of the margin. And quite rightly, whether it's through good management and lawyering or reversions or renegotiations, the songs end up back in the hands of the people that co-created them, who I buy from. But the three big recorded music companies use their leverage of owning the song companies to A, stop the song companies from advocating, and B, to push as much of the economic improvement towards recorded music where they're getting the lion's share of the margin at the expense of the songwriter. And I'm the catalyst to change that system. I'm very vocal about changing that system. And even though it's something that's going to take a number of years to bring to fruition, it speaks very, very loudly to the songwriting community today. And we've therefore become the favored buyer from the songwriting community. The success of hypnosis definitely comes with such strong values and principles that you hold near and dear to what is needed in the industry. And so maybe you could expand on that just for a moment. You know, you see change within the industry. What would you like to change if you could change anything over the coming year or two? Well, the, the, you know, there's change that, that's important in, in, in a number of, of, of areas, right? So on, on the one hand, you have uh, this great initiative to take the songwriter from being the lowest man or woman on the totem pole to the top man or woman on the totem pole. Because, you know, the, the business that I came into 35 years ago was one where 90% of the artists that you would sign were people that wrote their own songs, that uh, performed them, that had a very good idea of who they were, who they might become. You know, this is the post Beatles paradigm of artists. Right, and the artist was the key person in the the industry. Today, ninety percent of the people that are being signed are very talented people, but the ultimate goal is fame. And it doesn't matter whether that fame comes from singing someone else's song, or whether it comes from a TV talent competition or social media. Um, and you know, there hasn't been an album in the last seven years, it's been a billboard top 100 album of the year that hasn't had an outside songwriter, right? So everyone from Ed Sheeran to Coldplay, you know, have the last time an, an, an artist had a top 100 album of the year that, 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 that didn't have an outside songwriter was Bob Dylan seven years ago, right? So the disparity that exists between recorded music and the songwriter has never been more glaring than it is right now because you've got incredible songwriters, a guy like Ryan Tedder, who writes a song like Sucker for the Jonas Brothers that allows the Jonas Brothers to go out and play for a million dollars a night because everybody wants to hear Sucker, yet Ryan Tedder, because he's the songwriter, is the low man or woman on the, in, in that economic equation. So that's the most important thing that we have to change. But then there's also social responsibility. So, you know, hypnosis has been uh, a, a big advocate and a big proponent of the Black Lives Matter movement. We are massive supporters of the African-American community because from the days of Elvis Presley singing Arthur Big Boy Crudup songs to the Beatles doing Chuck Berry songs and Little Richard songs to the Rolling Stones doing Bobby Womack songs to Motown, black music and, and obviously hip hop today, black music has always made the world go round, yet we're at a point in time where our brothers and sisters in, in, in the black community are being marginalized more than ever, are dealing with police brutality, are dealing with all kinds of heinous situations that no person should ever have to go through. And I feel that we have a real social responsibility, um, not just because of the art, but because of the leverage that we have as a business to change that. So when Ahmaud Arbery was murdered earlier this year, and three months later, two and a half months later, there were still no charges brought in Liberty County in Georgia, I wrote to the DA of Liberty County and I basically outlined it for them. I said, listen, I've invested a hundred million dollars in Georgia in the past 18 months. 
I've invested that money in African American songwriters that uh, you know have tremendous spending, that power, that uh, pay their taxes, that you know put money into the economy on a daily basis, that importantly write the songs for the biggest artists in the world from Beyonce to Jay-Z to Kanye West to Madonna to Britney Spears and these people have really loud voices and unless you do something about this we're going to really start to use our loud voices and within a couple of days I had an email back saying that they'd received my email and they'd acknowledged it with a couple within a couple of days after that the first arrests in Ahmaud Arbery's murder were made and this is something that is an example that I think everyone that's in this business should be following. We shouldn't just be um, talking a good game. We should recognize that un uh, ultimately the only thing that really speaks, the only currency that really matters in bringing social justice is money, right? So if you're a company like ours that has the backing of billions of pounds that has investors that range from the Church of England to Investec to AXA to Aviva. You must lead by example and you must help to make the world a better place. Um, and then of course, there's what we're talking about today in many ways, which is mentorship. And that's something that you know I think is 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 a key part of, of this business. And Nile Rogers, you know, who's written some of the most important songs in the world with his group Chic, for Diana Ross, for Madonna, for David Bowie, for Daft Punk, for, you know, Sister Sledge, you know, that came up with, you know, that wrote the song We Are Family. He, he created a foundation in the wake of 9-11 uh, um, uh, called the We Are Family Foundation after the song that brought people together for the obvious reasons. And that organization has gone from strength to strength over the past 20 years. But in 2008, they created an offshoot of it called Three Dot Dash, that is the youth initiative of the We Are Family Foundation that has an incredible mentorship, you know, year long mentorship programs with everyone from people in Bill Gates organization to you know, the daughter of Malcolm X to, you know, lots of really, really special people that take upwards of a year with young leaders from around the world and help to mentor them and make the world a better place. The relationships that you're building, the people that you're working beside, the great social change that you're bringing to the world all speaks a little bit to the purpose and the intentionality of mentorship. So maybe you start by telling us about a mentor who's inspired you in your life, Mark. Um, I'm sure there are many, but if you'd, if you'd like to share one with us today, that would be great. Sure. So, you know, for me, um, uh, you know, on the one hand, you've got mentorship, right? On the other hand, you've got various avenues of, of education, right? So, you know, you've got, you know, high school, you've got university, colleges, you know, specialist schools, et cetera. Um, but what the music business really thrives on, or at least the classic music business really thrives on, excuse me, is apprenticeship, right? Because, you know, so much of what we do is not something that you can be taught in the classroom. It's something that, you know, you have to learn the hard way um, by, you know, encountering the various situations because, you know, ultimately it's the creative process, right? And, and the creative process is, you know, when you're not a creator like I am, you know, I can't play the guitar, I can't sing a song, but yet I can get the best out of people and I've learned how to get the best out of people because I've dealt with so many geniuses, whether it's Axl Rose, whether it's Elton John, whether it's Nile Rogers, whether it's Beyonce, you know, I've, I've, you know, I've been blessed to be surrounded by geniuses and to see the way that they react to situations. Um, and, you know, I've, you know, in, in many ways, I suppose, you know, I've become a sort of horse whisperer for, um, you know, people that, that, that create. But the key element that I bring to that is that I listen. Now, on the one hand, it's obvious that I listen to the music, but on the other hand, what's not so obvious is that what I'm really doing is 
listening and watching these people um, at, you know, sometimes right under their nose and sometimes at a distance so I can see what it is that works for them and what it is that doesn't work for them. Because my job is to create an environment where these people can be confident in and they can do their very, very best work without roadblocks or anything else. Because, you know, for most people, you know, God has given them this level of talent because he's left something else in their life imperfect, let's say, right? So, so you know, you've got to, to um, you know, be cognizant of, and, and each person is different. You've got to be cognizant of what it is that, that, that allows them to be confident and to deliver their best work. You know, for me, mentorship is one where, on the one hand, I'm looking to mentor people, but on the other hand, what I'm also looking for is to teach them this business because this business has a very, very bright future in front of it. Thanks to streaming, I can actually look someone in the eyes and say, actually, the best days of the music business are in front of you. They're not in front of me. I've already had my time. And while I still have some, some, some time left, that's all well and great. But the real glory days of this business, which only a few short years ago would have appeared to be part of my lifetime, are actually gonna be a part of this 16, 17, 18, 19 year old person's lifetime. So, you know, on the one hand, mentorship, you know, what's that about? It's about, you know, expressing values to somebody. It's about, you know, downloading experiences on them that hopefully will allow them to have shortcuts um, to and, and accelerate their growth and success. But I also think on the other hand, you know, what you really want to do, and it doesn't matter whether you're a doctor or a lawyer or someone like myself in music, is you want to find somebody to mentor that has similar interests or that wants to follow a career path that's similar to yours so that hopefully you can be also apprenticing them um, uh, at, at, at the same time. You know, so not only are you, you know, expressing values and expressing um, common sense and, 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 and other things that are the same can accelerate a person's growth, but hopefully you're also able to teach them something about the trade that they want to be in um, so that they can follow in your path because nothing could make me prouder than to know that I'm taking my knowledge. You know, I, I believe in a metaphysical, spiritual way, I believe that the world is always expanding, right? But, you know, at the end of the day, when you distill that, that hopefully means that, um, you know, instead of the next person having to start at A, and go to B, they can start at J and, you know, go to K, L, M, N, and O, right? The people that have been mentors in my life, um, and I was just praising many of them the other day, I've, I've had numerous mentors. Um, you know, the first person that comes to mind is, is uh, a gentleman that sadly no, no longer with us called Elliot Roberts, um, who was Neil Young's manager for almost 60 years before he passed away um, 18 months ago. Um, and Elliot was a guy that, that um, as I was growing up, I was very clear. Um, you know, there was a voice in my ear, whether you look at that as instinct or intuition or the voice of God, that was very clear with me that I was never going to be Jimmy Page or Robert Plant or Neil Young, but that I could be in music. But if I and if I wanted to be in music, I would have to find a path that was not the performing path or the creative path, but someone that supported those people. And the first person that I discovered through my love of Neil Young and Joni Mitchell was this guy, Elliot Roberts, who was the most extraordinary manager, who managed Joni Mitchell, who managed Neil Young, who managed Bob Dylan, who managed Crosby, Stills, Nash and & Young, and Crosby, Stills & Nash, and the three guys as individuals, and everyone from Devo to the Cars. Um, and he became a great friend of mine, and he became a mentor, and he just taught me a lot. And, and in many ways, the most important thing that he taught me was to enjoy 
every minute of what you do. You're not digging ditches. You know, you're 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 part of music. There's all these beautiful people. There's you know so much that's going on. Enjoy every minute of it and make sure that um, you know the people that you're turning on are people that can then enjoy every minute of what they're doing as well. And then there was a guy called Bruce Finley that managed Simple Minds that were, you know, probably the first big artists that I was personally a part of. And Bruce was the guy that, you know, he never distilled it in, in, in his words. These are my words. But, you know, my job is to make people believe in what I believe in. And because it's an integrity-based system, in order to, you know, for, for, for me to have a career, I can only make people believe in the things that I genuinely believe in. Because if I tell you that something is the best thing since sliced bread, then it better be the best thing since sliced bread. Because otherwise, the next time I come along and tell you this is the be best thing since sliced bread, you're just going to shut the door on me, right? So, so, you know, Bruce was the first guy that I ever saw in real time make people believe in what he was believing in. You know, he would tell stories about Simple Minds and he would, you know, gather the record company around and the promotion people and the salespeople, and he would make them want to work as hard for the band as he worked for the band. Um, and he, I was one of the people that, that, you know, that he weaved that magic on. And hopefully I've been weaving that same magic on people, um, you know, for every day of, of, of the last 35 years or so as, as a result. And he's an important part of that. And then, um, you know, there would be uh, two guys, Rod Smallwood and Andy Taylor, that were guys that managed Iron Maiden and that I managed Iron Maiden with and became uh, my partners. And the only thing that they both had in common with each other, besides being best friends, friends was that they could drink anyone on, on, under the table but even then one of them would drink like crazy and couldn't remember a thing the next morning and the other one would drink like crazy and could remember the finest points of an 85 page contract and i sort of became the bastard offspring of the two of these guys where on the one hand i understood creativity and on the other hand i understood business and could bring those two things together in a way that would allow me to, um, you know, understand and protect the art of these great artists that I work with. Um, and on the other hand, maximize the commerce while ensuring that that art was protected. And then the final two people that I would mention would be Elton John and Nile Rogers, who are two of the greatest artists that I've ever worked with because our relationships were completely based and are still completely based on an enthusiasm for music, right? You know, have you heard this? No, I haven't heard that. What about this? Have you heard that? You know, have you seen what's gone into the charts? And, you know, Niall and I will, every, you know, every morning our days start with talking about music and every day our days end with talking about music. And that just makes, you know, for incredible joy and it makes me work harder. It makes him work harder. And, uh, you know, my life is blessed to, to be surrounded by these geniuses. Mm. With passion and purpose comes great opportunity and tremendous credibility. Clearly something that your legacy is so well known for, Mark. Now, um, for our entrepreneurs joining us today, I'd love to maybe spend our remaining couple of minutes talking about some of the great wisdom and insights that you've learned along the way building out hypnosis. So from what you've observed, uh, working beside great talent and also in building this company, what do you think are the tremendous uh, traits and attributes that an entrepreneur needs to be able to survive and thrive in this current world? Well, I think the most important thing that I would suggest to anyone is authenticity, right? Because, you know, if, if you, re, you know, if you, if you think about it, you know, as an entrepreneur, you're inevitably going to put yourself in front of investors and you're going to ask those, those people to bet on you, right? Now, you know, on the one hand, there's the joy of them saying yes. On the other hand, there's tremendous responsibility that comes with that, right? So I feel um, as much responsibility to my investors as I do to these great songwriters that are trusting me in, in, in our company to be the custodian of their songs. And I make sure that I can fulfill that responsibility 
at all times. So I'm surrounded and I pay for way more advice than I could ever possibly need because I would rather be on the right side of ensuring that I have the best information possible available to me. But when I talk about authenticity, I'll tell you a story about, you know, we, we started to take hypnosis to the market um, with a different brokerage company than the one that we successfully brought the company to the market with. And I sat down and in my own words, I told these people what the proposition was almost as I did with you 10 minutes ago, right? Almost the same identical words. They all fell in love with that. They all decided that they wanted to put their time and their effort into doing that. But then they wanted me to do it in a way that they had analyzed that wasn't in my own words, that wasn't authentic, and that was basically trying to take something and turn it into a pitch, right? Now, what made me successful is that I don't pitch anybody, right? I come along and I explain the proposition to people. And if they like the proposition and they understand it, then I want them to be a part of it. If they don't, then, you know, thank you very much for taking the time to meet with me, but I'll move on to the next person. Um, and our attempt um, failed dramatically um, because of that. I mean, I could barely even get the words out of my mouth that they wanted me to say or do because it was totally inauthentic, right? There was my, my body was just riddled with resistance because they wanted me to say and do things that were not, you know, the, the, what, what, what really was the essence of the story. I then went along and found new brokers and I explained the situation to them. And I explained that there was not going to be a debt or you know, a pitch book, that I would never ever work to anything like that. And that all I wanted from them was to put me in front of the right people that I could explain this proposition to. And again, the ones that wanted that understood and wanted to, to, to be a part of it could be. And you know, the ones that didn't. Again, thank you very much for taking the time to speak to me, but I'm never, ever trying to sell anybody. I'm only explaining what the proposition is and then allowing that person to make their own decisions. And, you know, with some of them, I'm, you know, I had to have seven or eight meetings where I explained greater detail. But at the end of the day, 177 meetings later, I raised 200 million pounds. I invested it in some of the best songs of all time. I actively managed those songs. I paid my dividends. I then did it again with 141 million pounds and again with 60 million pounds and on and on and on to the point where we're now 1.1 billion pounds. We have an incredible investor base that really understands our business, really understands songs as an asset class because we've educated them. And you know the the key you know as I say become a FTSE 250 company become one of the biggest yielders on the index and it's all been done authentically because there was no let me try to sell you on something. We often say you have to own the value of why you're doing this, right? There's a thousand reasons why not to be an entrepreneur. So if you're going to go down that path, lean into it fully because it's going to take everything you have and some. Um, I want to finish with one uh, last ask, if we can. What's the best piece of advice, if possible, that you've been given over your career, Mark? What's the one that stays with you and helps you on those difficult days? You have to listen. Right? Listen and pay attention to everything that's going on around you. Right? We're driven by ego. We're driven by a desire to succeed. We're driven by so many positive things, but ultimately, if you're not listening, you're not going to get all of the information and you're not going to, to um, uh, make the best use of this expansion that takes place in the world, right? So I mentioned Rod Smallwood earlier um, and uh, uh, as being one of my mentors and, and my partner. And he came into the office one day and, um, you know, he said, what are you doing? And I explained it. 
And he said, man, you know, you were up at seven o'clock in the morning doing this and you were up at 11 o'clock last night doing this. You know, when are you going to take some mental free time? And I was offended. I was like, WTF, like what? <laughs> I'm working my myself into the ground here and you're talking about mental free time. You know, I was, you know, seriously offended. Um, and he said, no, go for a walk. Go for a walk and take the time to think about what it is that you're doing. You're just doing, right? And you're doing a great job, but you're not taking the time to think about what it is that you're doing. And as I say, at the time I was offended, now, you know, whatever it is, 30 years later, I consider it to be amongst the most important pieces of advice I was ever given. Mark, it has been an absolute joy, such a pleasure. Thank you for bringing so much joy and beauty to this world through perhaps my favorite asset class at this moment. Um, I hope we have a chance to work together again and thank you for your support of mentor makers in this time. It's my pleasure, thank you so much.